I can't say enough about Reverend Dr. Ruth Miller. I refer to her as my personal spiritual guru. And um, she's been there at times when I've needed guidance and, and comfort the most. And she's been there. And always with a certain degree of imagination. So please, Ruth, tell us about imagination today. You are amazing. Thank you so very much. <laughs> Can everyone hear me okay now? Yes? Good. Well, it's a delight to be with you. I cannot tell you how good it feels to hear and see all those wonderful ideas that we've just experienced and expressed. Isn't that fabulous? I have so missed that over these last months. Thank you, thank you. And Linda, what an incredible job you're doing putting those slides together in that music. And Anne, thank you for hosting it. This is just a great treat to see all of this happening. And I hope that you all benefit as much as I am right this minute. <laughs> and having said that, this all started with an imagining. <laughs> it was the realization that everyone was missing each other and that phone calls were nice, but not sufficient. And there are some other places where they're doing something like this, although I have to say they're not produced nearly as nicely as what we've just been through. And, ah, wouldn't it be nice if maybe Ocean Unity could have a gathering along these lines? Wow. And it happened. Well done. Well done. Hmm. I love the word imagination. Imagination. <laughs> um, you know, we're imaging a nation. It's also I mage a nation. <laughs> So I, magician, I bring forth as magic in a magical way, a nation. And nation is not necessarily one of the nation states in the United Nations of this globe. It is a world, a state of being. Nation actually is, comes, comes from a word that means to be born. <laughs> so I am a borning. I am a borning. <laughs> I am bringing forth, I mage or I image a birthing. It's just a marvelous way to play when you get to take apart a word like that, isn't it? Now, I'm going to do a quick question. How many of you feel like you really don't have very much of an imagination? You were told in school you're not very creative or whatever. I can't imagine very many of you do, but how many? Anybody here feel? Oh, good. So, I don't, Linda, I know better. <laughs> I was told that. Oh, I got it. Okay. Oh, my, my. All right. So anybody else willing to raise their hand? <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you, Stephanie. You know, when we tend to think rationally, linearly, you know, come up with, you know, the solution to something, when we analyze things, uh, when we are, you know, offered an opportunity to do something in the first place we go is, well, how could I do that? Then we tend to think of ourselves as not very imaginative. And if we tend to think, you know, again, linearly and, you know, problem solving and analytically, we tend to think we're not very good at visualizing either. Is there anyone in the group that feels like they're not a very good visualizer? You can't come up with, you yeah, can't see very well in your mind. Okay, so what I'm, I'm going to do is a really quick one on this one. Let's close your eyes briefly. And um, I don't think any of you are sitting in your kitchen. So except maybe Marie. <laughs> but see, remember your kitchen. Just remember what your kitchen is. Remember standing at the counter by the sink. Remember... Uh, the water running at the sink. Remember maybe some dishes that you've washed. Remember how the light is through the window. Now, someone just brought a rose and put it on the counter next to the sink. You see that beautiful rose sitting there on the counter next to the sink? Welcome to the realm of imagination. <laughs> we all do this all the time. Thank you. You don't have to close your eyes. Anymore. <laughs> this is what imagination is. It usually starts with remembering 
starts with seeing in our minds something that feels familiar to us. And then there's just a little tweak, a little addition, a little something that extends, expands, shifts that a little bit. There's a wonderful Facebook meme out there. It has to do with um, you know, various theories, right? And there is the theory that is, goes from A to B, and then there's the theory that goes A, B, C, and then it goes A to C implies B, and there's increasing complex theories, right? Till you get to string theory, which is everywhere, all over, everywhere. And then the next one on the meme is conspiracy theory, and it looks like a unicorn, okay? Conspiracy theory is a so totally typical, normal human process. We make stories and it's how our imagination works. So back to the idea that someone just put a rose next to my kitchen sink while I'm standing there, my mind immediately goes, who did that? What color is the rose? What did they mean by doing that? That's the story that our human minds are constantly weaving for every two points of data. Theory and science is exactly that. It's a story. A mathematical equation is just a sentence written in a different language. When I used to teach computer programming, it was the same thing. I would do, okay, here's the sentence in English. Here's the sentence in French. Here's the sentence, sentence in algebra now here, or calculus, whichever it was. And here is the sentence in this particular programming language. That's all it is. So I've imagined a possibility I've written a sentence describing it in whatever language is appropriate to the situation. We make up stories and we'll use whatever language we've got. It might be the language of symbols. It might be the language we were born in. It might be the language we've learned as an adult. It might be the language that our discipline requires us to do. I call that jargon. It's an inert gas along with neon and argon and jargon, you know. <laughs> It doesn't accomplish much, but it works. <laughs> right? So when we are in a situation where we have something happening and something else happening, our minds are wired to figure out a path between those two. And it is our imagination that draws on all our past experiences and tries to figure all of that out. So this topic is so important at this stage in our nation, in the birthing of what is happening on North America right now, because people are letting their imaginations run wild and then they're acting from their imaginings. And some of them are acting in a very wonderful, positive direction that is creating a culture that's absolutely sustainable and loving and capable. And that's part of what unity is about, isn't it? But some of them uh, and some of us sometimes get caught up in the fears and we start imagining what could happen if or what must be happening. If I'm seeing this and this, then this must be happening. And if those people in the media are telling me this and this, then there must be all kinds of things going on behind the scenes that I don't know about. And I can imagine what those might be. And if I spend enough time imagining what those must be, I can convince myself that that is what is. And then the body mind wants to act to fix it if it's wrong or to help it if we think it's right, if it feels like it's in support of what we think we believe. So imaginings can take us anywhere on the map. It can take us traveling to all kinds of interesting places, and it can take us emotionally to all kinds of interesting places. Sigh. <laughs> so in unity, and in all of the New Thought Movement, whether it's Centers for Spiritual Living or Divine Science or any of them, our fundamental discipline is what am I thinking and is it in alignment with what I intend my world to be? That's it. 
So as soon as I begin to feel like my imaginings are spinning out of something that isn't in alignment with what I intend my world to be, the discipline is to stop <laughs> and to begin to go, oh, what would I rather see than this? What would I rather the world be than this? Right? That is the fundamental discipline. And what I encourage everyone to do is find something, some physical action or some uh, set of words or something that can act as my break on such spinning tales and images and possibilities and can then allow me to shift into the direction I wish to go. Now, those of you who've heard me speak before may remember that often what I will use is looking up at trees against the sky. First of all, I'm looking up. This is an important thing because when we look down, we have um, greater tendency to get caught in the downs. <laughs> but when we look up, we tend to connect more with a higher level of vibration. And if you've seen any of the meditators, those, those guys, their eyes roll up inside their head as they're going into samsara, you know, whatever it is they're going into, um, then that, that's part of what they're doing. They're looking up for that. So if that's the first thing. The second is the expanse of the sky, the beautiful, incredible expanse. Even if it's cloudy, it goes on forever, right? Or sometimes there's that pattern of clouds in the sky and or it's that blue that really goes on forever, right? And then the third part is those living things that are constantly giving to us. Remember the, the poem, um, you know, the, the giving tree, the guy, wrote, uh, Shel Silverstein, uh, where the sidewalk ends in the giving tree, right? The trees are always giving to us. They just, that's who and what they are, right? There's a wonderful ecological principle that a mature tree in a house, in the yard of a house will provide all the oxygen a family of four needs and will reduce the temperature of their house during the summer by as much as 20 degrees one mature tree just be in a tree right <laughs> so when i look up and see that all of those awarenesses are right there and that can stop the funk or stop the story that my mind has been spinning trying to explain this point and this point that the media fed me <laughs> right or that someone has expressed or whatever it is so it's a very useful tool for me you will find something else for you i remember when i was in college we had the psychology professor had us uh, at one point he said now everyone squeeze your knee with your right hand squeeze your right knee with your right hand and then he said something very important and then later in the class he said that again and he said squeeze your knee again and when I yeah, said, no, when it's on the test, squeeze your knee, you'll remember it. <laughs> right? So that kind of thing, it's a stimulus response. It's just classic stuff, but it works <laughs> because it gets us out of what we thought we were in. Oh, I don't know this. I don't know this. Oh, yes, I know this. <laughs> oh, I'm so upset. Oh, I'm so oh yeah, that's what's real. <sighs> So when we are imagining, we are making images, and a lot of them are visual, but a lot of them are what we call kinesthetic. They're in our bodies. They are not just in our vision. And one of the things that a lot of people found out, and Jean Houston is one of the great teachers of this, is that the more senses we can bring to our imagining, the more likely we are to experience it as real. So if I imagine um, 
a, a home or a relationship or a, a piece of work or something, you know, in its final beautiful state. And I can bring not just the colors and the textures, but I can bring a sense of what it feels like sitting in the chair, maybe in the home or, you know, the, the, the joy of having it all come together or the receiving of the outcome. If I can feel those things, if I can hear sounds, if I can taste, taste, smell things. When I do guided visualizations, I encourage people to bring all of their senses to that. Feel the air against your skin if you're imagining being somewhere. If feel, you know, listen to the sounds around you, et cetera. Now, when you do this, the body mind doesn't know that you haven't physically been there. The body mind says, wow, we just had a vacation or we just accomplished this thing, right? it's real to the memory system the body system and therefore we start acting in the world as this has already happened this is already my experience and then of course using what is now called the law of attraction we get more of that kind of experience this is why we encourage this now it's more than that though. And one of my favorite stories from the Vietnam War is that there was a POW, one of the Air Force uh, officers was held you know, for 18 months in solitary and he was finally released. And he was flown to Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. And it happened that he arrived the night before a pro-am golf tournament. It turns out he is an avid golfer. And as a courtesy to this guy who was an avid golfer, they, you know, to welcome him home, they uh, you know, let him have a place in the Pro-Am tournament. He won. After 18 months in solitary, Terry, solitary confinement, because he had in his mind played every course that he'd ever played over and over again, including the Clark Air Force, because that's the base out of which he had flown at the Philippines. So he knew that course. He was never not golfing, even though he was a POW in a Vietnamese camp. Wow, right? The body mind knows. The first experiments in this were in the 60s, some Indiana basketball players. Uh, they took one, they were practicing and one group went in every day for an hour every day, shooting and bouncing and playing and doing the various kinds of rehearsal king, things that basketball teams do. One group sat on their couch and felt and saw and imagined doing it. And one group just kind of, you know, went off and did whatever they felt like doing. Well, the time came to come back into physical practice and prepare to play the games. And the guys who had been practicing every day did really well. The guys who'd been sitting on their couch imagining practicing every day did 80 to 90% as well as the ones who had been there every day shooting hoops. The guys who just just everything, well, you know what they did, <laughs> about 20% as well. <laughs> Partly because they couldn't not imagine playing because that's what they did, right? In the background, sometimes if that's something you do regularly, it's going to pop up in your memory anyway. So what is it that we want to be and do in the world? We get to do it inside first bringing as many senses as possible, as much of a sense of our body working in it as possible in order to be able to experience the results. Now, this is also the core of Unity's healing process. If I am involved in any process for myself or anyone else, my job is to see and feel feel and smell and taste and touch <laughs> this wholeness this perfect functioning for whether it's myself or anyone else and to know that even for an instant transforms the whole system more into that so we use words absolutely but the words are partly to get us to that place where the 
our own body, mind, and spirit are in alignment in the knowing and the feeling and the seeing and the hearing and the tasting and touching. Yes, this is what is so. And then we begin to have it become the quote reality, the physical experience that everyone shares, not just our own internal state. And sometimes it's instantaneous. And sometimes it takes a while because we have a lot of beliefs that kind of slow it down. Yeah. So imagination is my imaging something that is being birthed in the moment. And what is it? I get to choose. Is it going to be based on fears and, and, and logical assessments based on somebody else's ideas? Or is it going to be based in what we know in unity to be true? There is one power and that is good and it is omnipotent. There is no other power. Nothing else is doing anything else in our bodies or in the world. That's the fundamental truth. Now, if I can imagine that as my experience and the experience of everyone in my world then i'm beginning to have that truth become what i am aligned on and every part of my body mind spirit system gets to experience it more and more fully now linda attends a, a thing i do at two on thursdays at two <laughs> which is partly what I do on Zoom. I create that experience for us that we can feel and see and know. But you don't have to be part of my thing to do that. Just set aside a time. Every day, ideally, morning and evening would be fabulous. Morning, noon, and night. This is why in the ancient Hebrew tradition and in the Muslim tradition, they pray five times a day. Their job is to align themselves with truth five times a day. That's all they're doing. It just happens to be saying a lot of words. So if we give ourselves two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, several times a day to get into that state where our visual and hearing and smelling and tasting and feeling are all going, yes, that is what is real. <sighs> We're actually bringing our whole world into alignment with the truth that we know to be the reality of all beingness everywhere. Thank you very much.